Hello, it's David at DSS UK, and in this thing, I should be talking about the next big thing we Sparks perhaps ought to be wrapping our collective hangovers around. What is that, you may well wonder? Well, if you listen to industry bullshit, then you'd assume it's smart tech. Just parting the pages of professional electrician exposes the lunacy on that front. Now, there's a Vire still using that four-year-old picture of me pretending to put up one of their downlights whilst sporting a mullet like some kind of friggin' Australian. But flicking past that handsome chap and we have smart lighting controls, smart homes for the sake of saving the environment, of course, smart technologies, smart home automation, smart fire safety from Fire Angel. Fuck me. Smart EV. It's this bullshit that made me want to leave the EV market. It just goes on and on. The team at Robus ponder whether you need to be smart to use smart lighting. Well, ponder this, motherfuckers. Yet more home automation. When smart is intelligent. Well, when it is, do let me know. Uh, talking to Alexa doesn't count. Durham University's smart heating controls, smart sound systems, Wi-Fi floodlights, nobody needs that. Christ on a bike, BG and Lakiko have a smart range. Some of their dumb floodlights don't last more than six months. Smart sockets from Skolmore, oh, enough. Okay, so it's not always like this, and Professional Electrician obviously had a hard-on for smart garbage in this particular edition of their rag. But all I ever seem to see in promo emails and adverts is how we installers are missing a trick if we're not on the cutting edge of this bullshit e-waste of the future. Well, it's either smart tech or renewables. That's another sector where we're being constantly beaten around the head with. Jamie Gobshite recently did a video on how the EV market is polluted by bottom feeders putting in shite installations that we legitimate installers cannot compete with, and how we're better off staying out of it until these shitheads go bust, at which point we can parachute in to put right all their dreadful wrongs like the heroes we are. And you know what? I completely agree, which is why I binned off EV earlier this year, and why I put the boot into PV last year in my Shade Browner video. You want to juice up your 60k Tesla, but you're too cheap to fork out for a proper electrician? No problem, mate. You get in some checker trade wanker to screw it onto the wall, and call me after the fire or shock incident to come and make good. But I'm going off on a tangent here. It was smart tech that I was moaning about, and it may shock you to hear that overcomplicated lighting and socket accessories that rely on a half assed app and will electrically fail before their time are not the next big thing we installers should be interested in at all. Energy logging, yeah, that's the big bollocks we ought to be looking at. Equipment that can do such is now within the realms of affordability and applying it can save your clients hard cash in these difficult days of high energy prices while opening the door to the worthy work of pulling out inefficient equipment for shinier upgrades. So you can shove your smart tech up your ass. Let's have a look at how logging works. And I apologize, this video will be drier than a nun's smudger, even with my attempts to pep it up with the usual piss and vinegar. I mean, energy logging. You can't make it interesting for fuck's sake. Energy logging is about helping our clients to understand where their power and their pennies are potentially pissed away. The proper equipment can also help you to understand an installation's demand, which is essential when your client is asking for things like electric showers and EV chargers. I had a customer recently who wanted three electric showers in his shitty 70s semi-detached and was surprised when I told him he only had a 60 amp service and it simply wasn't going to happen. He figured he could draw whatever energy he wanted, so long as he was willing to pay for it. What an asshole. I don't deal with a lot of three-phase installations myself, so I'm armed today with a Chauvin Arnoux Pell 51 single-phase logging instrument, and it's the likes of this as a baseline that many electricians perhaps ought to be adding to their instrument loadout. While the Pell 51 is just single-phase, there is a two-phase Pell 52, and the Pell 103, which is the three-phase variant. And no, I don't have a frigging clue how Chauvin figure out their instrument model numbers. Anyway, the Pell 103 happens to be priced more out of my budgetary bracket. However, it is possible to hire this kind of equipment from the likes of CEF and Sunbelt for any one-off jobs. This horrendously wordy video isn't a how-to on how to use the Pell 51, but I will point out what I'm doing with it and some of the pertinent information it spouts out. Chauvin do have a YouTube channel linked in the description where you might find more instructional information if that's what you want. A quick introduction to this thing to get us going then. The instrument is designed to be connected to the power source it is monitoring so it can record voltage and frequency. So although it has a backup battery for short outages of an hour or so when left logging out on site, it's important to keep it connected to the phase you're monitoring. 
We had an EV job where we were using it to measure demand over several days, only to find upon returning to collect it that the homeowner had switched off the socket we'd plugged it into minutes after we'd left. So yeah, cheers mate. This is our current clamp, and although it might be referred to as a CT clamp, that would be erroneous. It's actually a Rogowski coil, which in simple terms is like an antenna that winds along the length of the thing and back. The loop does click closed, but that's just to secure it. It doesn't need to be closed to operate unlike a traditional current transformer. This makes it a lower profile and more flexible. I can easily place it around the line tail for a hole site or an individual line wire if just one circuit or item of equipment is to be monitored. I do find wrapping it around the wire under test up to three times improves accuracy as I have here with my Barrett Sing loops, but you need to tell the instrument if you've used one, two or three windings in the coil. The power connections use banana plugs for a direct connection via test leads to the installation, but it also has a nifty adapter to allow connection to a figure eight lead, allowing it to be plumbed into an existing socket outlet if one is nearby on the same phase. The terminals are labelled as V1 and neutral, and a figure eight lead is non-polarised, so if you're seeing negative numbers on the screen then the power connector is perhaps arse about tit. The Rogowski dongle also needs to be fitted the correct way around, although if your balls add up then at least you can reverse it in the software. If no socket is present to power the device, you can use these clever magnetic connectors to take juice directly from the circuit under test at the distribution board. On my test rig, I currently have zero loads. Everything is off, so the only data being displayed on the LCD is the voltage and frequency. I'm gonna plug in an electric radiator so we can see some live numbers. Ugh. However, before I do that, I want to place my Robin O meter across the line and neutral pins of the radiator's plug top. 36.3 ohms I'm getting from the plug top itself. So uh, I've recorded that for some mathematical shenanigans later. So let's bear that resistance reading in mind uh, and then we'll go live to see what the logger logs. Live results are dancing around on the LCD screen here, but I've taken some static captures to show what we're looking at. We've got 6.57 amps at 238.2 volts, 1,570 watts or 1 1.5 kilowatts, and a frequency of 49.96 hertz. On the second screen, we're again seeing the 1.5 kilowatt power reading at the top, then there's a VAR of practically zero, and the volt amps near as damn it matches the wattage. Flicking to the third screen, we have a power factor of one. I'm gonna unplug that radiator as it's 30 Celsius in the office here. It always seems to be in the summer months when I need to use a radiator or a hairdryer for a demo. And yes, I know the, the shirt is a little out of season, but you know, you can't keep a good shirt down. Anyway, let's rattle through what that little lot is all about. The voltage is what the voltage is, of course, and the current being pulled by this purely resistive appliance ought to match what Ohm's law says it should be, i.e. 238.2 volts divided by the 36.3 ohms we measured on the Robin a moment ago, which comes to 6.56 amps. We can also verify the wattage we're seeing on the display by multiplying the measured current by the voltage. 6.56 amps multiplied by 238.2 volts equals 1,562 watts. Again, well, fuck it, that's about as close enough to what we were reading here. The real-time numbers were dancing about a bit as I took these captures. Because this radiator is purely resistive, it has no reactive component, the VAR is pretty much reading zero, and the apparent power measured in volt amps matches the wattage. So we have a power factor of one. What on earth does all that mean, David, you twat? I hear some of you oiks rudely ask. Okay, I'm going to try and explain what I think I know as I attempt to wrap my head around this thing, but I'm no expert on the horror that is power, so pick me up in the comments should you catch me talking out of my arse. I'll also direct you to the Joe Robinson training channel as he has videos on AC theory which will very politely shit over anything I can crudely staple together here. We all know about power, or at least true power. Multiply your current by your voltage and you get a value in watts. We just did that a moment ago on that radiator example and found it was pulling about the current and wattage we expected considering the voltage and resistance we had measured. That's fine for DC circuits or in resistive loads on AC. We can think of wattage as the true or active power. It's doing all the work of converting the energy I'm paying for into, in this case, the heat I want my radiator to radiate. There'll be some tiny losses through resistance of wiring and joints and such, but it's negligible. Aside from that resistance and the resistance of the heating elements, there's no reactance of any note for us to worry about with this kind of load. 
A pictorial representation of this resistive fun, a phasor diagram, shows the wattage is made up by the voltage and current being directly in phase with one another. If we look at them as a sine wave, the voltage and current are in sync, peaking and troughing at the same time, which is why working out wattage is simply the product of the two. This is all well and dandy, and it's hand jobs all round for purely resistive loads such as my radiator, where current and voltage are kept in sync. However, many of today's gizmos and do-wickers have elements that introduce reactance, which pushes voltage and current out of phase with respect to each other. This reactive power isn't really power at all. Instead, it's electricity being used to produce and sustain the magnetic and electric fields many items of AC equipment require to do their job. Earlier we saw a phasor diagram of true power made up of volts and amps in sync with each other. Let's take that arrow and expand it out into a circle split into four quadrants. Power in the direction of the centre of the circle to the right is still our true power, but I'm going to label it as positive power, that's power we're consuming to drive a load such as my radiator. Power in the opposite direction is also true power, but negative effect. An example of that is when my solar PV is generating more energy than I'm consuming, and it's being exported back out to the grid. We'll refer to this horizontal centre line as P to represent true power, regardless of the direction it's in. Purely reactive power, represented by Q, will bugger away from true power at a 90 degree angle, because a purely reactive load would be this much out of phase with true power. In reality, there is no such thing as a purely reactive load, as some resistance will always be present. But if we connect the two, the phase angle represented by the Greek letter theta will be somewhere between 0 degrees, purely resistive on the P line, and 90 degrees for purely reactive on the Q line. Just to aggravate your hangover further, there are two types of reactive power. Inductive, displayed on the PEL in quadrants 1 and 3, and capacitive in quadrants 2 and 4. Inductance has the psi unit of L and capacitance C. Inductive reactants will cause current to lag voltage by up to 90 degrees. Capacitive reactants will cause current to lead voltage by up to 90 degrees. You may recall the civil mnemonic from classroom lessons of the past, where the first three letters of that word reminds us that with capacitive reactants, current, I, is before or leads, voltage, V, and the last three letters show us that with L, inductive reactants, the current lags or comes after the voltage. Oh, come on, I did warn you this video wouldn't be any fun. We know that resistance opposes the flow of electrical current and is measured in ohms. You can perhaps visualise the effect of resistance as a large water pipe connected to a narrower pipe, causing a bottleneck to the flow. This bottleneck would represent an increase in resistance because the water is under pressure from the supply and it must now push through a narrower space. Inductive reactants is represented as XL and capacitive reactants as XC, and they are also measured in ohms. If we really want to stretch this shaky aqueous analogy, you can perhaps think of reactants not as a narrowing of the water pipe, but as a slight uphill angle which serves to impede the natural flow, because the plumbers are twat. Going back to this horror, we can see that capacitive and inductive elements work in opposite directions and can serve to cancel each other out. If XL and XC have the same value, there'll be no Q line, no phase angle, current and voltage will be synchronised, and the net loss will be zero. However, the presence of either kind of reactants will push current out of phase with voltage, and this phase shift means we can no longer simply multiply current by voltage to get an idea of what our power is. A reactive load will still burn through true power in its operation, but we now have reactive power to contend with, and it will give us this Q line in one of our quadrants. There's no psi unit for reactive power, it's just the product of voltage and reactive current, so it's measured as volt amps reactive or VAR. Not that I know anything about football, or indeed any sport, but try googling VAR and you'll get a load of nonsense about refereeing, it seems. OK, we have our true power and our reactive power for anything that isn't purely resistive. This third line in green connecting the two gives us our apparent power, designated as S. Again, no psi unit, it's measured in volt amperes. Now, I don't remember much about my school days other than wanting to burn the fucking place down and having a permanent hard-on for a girl called Kyla, whose signature move was to hoof any boy unexpectedly in the balls if they happened to be staring into space while standing with their legs astride. Now that's my kind of woman! But those who can still remember their old trigonometry lessons will recall that in a right-angle triangle, such as what we seem to have ended up with here, the hypotenuse, in this case the green line representing apparent power, 
is always longer than the opposite or adjacent sides, representing reactive and true power, respectively. Seeing as apparent power is a combination of both true and reactive power, we do expect it to be bigger than either. To visualise this further, let's use the boring and well-worn pint of beer analogy that everyone always seems to fall back to. You know, I'd wish you'd go all European on this and switch up the beer measures by the litre, because that's a much better portion as far as I'm concerned, and means fewer trips to the bloody bar. Sue and Keith run the Farting Nigel, a quaint public house in the little village of Wankstain. When Keith pours a pint, he provides a fair measure. That cool, sweet, bubbling, refreshing, liquid fucking gold shimmering away in the glass represents true power in watts. It's the stuff you want, and it'll get the job done. That job being to make you merry, make you depressed, forget you just sent those dick pics to, and cause you to awake the following morning with a stinking headache and your cock stuck in the end of a traffic cone obtained from fuck knows where. <coughs> oh come on, it can't just be me. Sticking with this well-worn analogy, reactive power measured in VAR, or volt amps reactive, is represented here as the head. You don't want too much of it, but you accept that it's usually going to be there, and Keith is pretty good at consistently keeping it minimised. We can therefore think of apparent power as the whole shebang. Sadly, Sue isn't so great behind the bar and has a reputation for giving good head. In a beer sense, you understand. Lining up lagers poured by both Keith and Sue shows we're getting less of what we really want when she's pulling the pints. The trouble is, when you fork over your cash, the price doesn't vary. Sue doesn't give it to us any cheaper, even though there's less of the luscious, frosty amber nectar in her servings, we're just getting less value for money. And you know, you would complain, but you let it slide because, well, Sue's got crack in tits. What this means in practice is that if the purpose of our pub patronage is primarily pint procurement, precipitating possibly proper paralytically pissed perversity, that is to say, getting drunk, then if Sue's serving, we're going to have to work a lot harder to achieve our desired wankered state through frequent returns to the busy bar. It's going to cost more too, as Sue's charging us for the glass, not for the liquid content. Domestically speaking, we pay per kilowatt hour, so in this analogy, only for the liquid. But large commercial customers may have billing based on their apparent power, or may be financially penalised if their reactive losses are high. Going back to how this relates to my electric radiator, we can see the reactive power is pretty much zero VAR, exactly because it is a resistive load. The apparent power therefore matches the true power in watts, which is doing all the work. We can apply a power factor to this by dividing the true power over the apparent power. In this case, 1570 watts divided by 1569 volt amperes, which gives us a value of 1, as we just saw on the LCD display. Power factor is a ratio, so there's no unit, it's just one, and that, my friends, is as good as it bloody well gets. A ratio of one to one means all the power we're paying for is being used to do all the active work without any loss. If only there were a way to better demonstrate what this thing is showing. Oh wait, there is. The Pel 51 Energy Logger has Wi-Fi built in and can communicate with Chauvin's Pell transfer software as installed on my trusty ThinkPad. Let's log something we can look at using my test rig here. There's nothing running on the rig at present. Even the Pell instrument itself is connected to a power source on a separate circuit, albeit on the same phase, so we get the correct voltage and frequency readings. Reconnecting my radiator, we can look at the real-time data shown in the software. We're now at 244.1 volts, 6.851 amperes at 50 hertz. And if we switch to the PQS data, power is at 1.672 kilowatt, Reactive power is zero, so apparent power matches true power and sits at 1.672 kilovolt amps. So we have a power factor of one. On the phaser, we're nailing the line between quadrants one and four as we're importing true power to run this thing and there's no reactants to pull us deep into any quadrant. To show something different, I've captured some lighting loads. The first uses a rather ridiculous and rare 180 watt incandescent lamp that I recorded for about seven minutes. I can't run this lamp for long. Most UK domestic lamp holders were only ever built for a maximum of 150 watts, otherwise the heat starts melting them. I've loaded in this capture data, and starting with the RMS, where the bottom scale is time, the left scale is voltage relating to the blue trace, the right scale is current and relates to the red trace. The voltage looks like it's bouncing around rather wildly, but that's quite normal at the very small scale we're focused in on here. The average value across the whole period is 242.2 volts, but there's only 2.3 volts difference between the min and max values over this period. 
Voltage sags might be down to local load switching in and out on my or my neighbour's installations. It's the current that's of greater interest and that lamp at 180 watts should be pulling about 0.74 amps or 740 milliamps. I've clocked the average a little higher here at 749.1 milliamps. Like the radiator, this incandescent lamp is a resistive load, so we shouldn't see much variation on the power traces. Our average true power, the red P trace across this recorded window, is 0.181 kilowatts, or 181 watts, which is what we expect to see. Reactive power, the orange Q trace, hovers around zero, as there's next to no reactants here. Let's zoom into these individually. There's true power bouncing around the 180 watt line, Here's reactive power rimming the bum hole of zero with a few spikes so small at this scale as to be of no consequence. This means the apparent power S here in green follows the same baseline trend as the true power did because there's no reactive component to be combined with it. Going back to our phaser diagram, what we're saying here is current is in phase with voltage. So reactive power is zero, there's no Q line, the phase angle is zero, and the apparent power in volt amperes is the same as the true power in watts, just as we saw with the electric radiator. It should come as no surprise then to find the power factor is bouncing round at the top end of a perfect one. Okay, so there are some tiny dips along the trace because nothing's perfect, not even me. However, the fluctuations are so tiny at this scale that the average out is next to fuck all. Looking at the energy plot, over time our true power consumption in red increases in a linear fashion, the apparent power exactly matching it, which is why we can't see the green line, unless I go into the individual traces where we can confirm that they do indeed tally. Here's the reactive power flatlining at around zero. There's the odd smidgen of line that dips below because, again, nothing's perfect, but it's small enough that we may discount it entirely here. The apparent power and the true power match at 0.021 kilovolt amp hours and 0.021 kilowatt hours respectively. So far, so sexy, but now let's use the logger to show something that's not purely resistive. And for this, I'm gonna pull in an old 1500 millimeter fluorescent light with a 58 watt tube. So I apologize for jumping off at a complete tangent here, but a quick, dirty, simplistic explanation on how this bastard bad boy operates may first be in order for those not in the know. In an ideal world, which this dirt ball we're all stuck on certainly isn't, we'd simply want to connect our fluorescent tube directly to the mains and have it illuminate. But 230 volts isn't a sufficient electromotive force to excite the gas in the tube and get it glowing. Instead, this light fitting uses a number of additional components to drive it. First, there's the ballast, also commonly called a choke for reasons we'll see later, and that's made up of a copper wire winding over an iron or steel core to form an inductive coil. We have a current path that passes through that, through a heating element in one end of the lamp, through a starter device, through another heating element at the opposing end of the lamp, and back to the supply via neutral. The key to getting a fluorescent light fluorescing is the starter, which, in essence, is a very basic time switch containing a bulb of argon or neon gas in which sits a bimetallic strip forming an open electrical contact. When switched on, current passes through the ballast, through the first heating element, and to the starter, where the physical path comes to a dead end at the open contact. However, the gas inside the starter is conductive, and current can pass through that, igniting it, which you may see as a visible glow or flash within the starter itself. The current path back to the neutral passes through the second heating element, however the gas in the starter makes this a high impedance path, which results in a low current that does nothing to get the ballast or heating elements doing anything useful at this time. That's okay, the job of this small initial current is to heat the starter, because the heat from that lighted gas will bend the bimetallic strip and close the contact point. I'm going to link to a video by Frontside Bus here, which shows a starter in action better than I could film it. We can see the gas in the starter's bulb heating up, bending the bimetallic strip out of shape, and eventually it contorts enough to touch the opposing contact. At this point the current path is physically shorted, and the voltage across the starter drops to zero, which extinguishes the ignited gas. With the contacts inside the starter now touching, this physical path suddenly offers a lower impedance to the flow of current than it trying to pass through a heated gas, so a larger current is now permitted throughout the circuit. This passes through the ballast's coil, and as school physics lessons tell us, when current flows down a wire, it produces a magnetic field. That field could be concentrated and enlarged by coiling wire tightly around an iron or steel core, as is the case in our ballast here. 
Enough current now also passes through the heating elements at each end of the tube to allow them to warm up and serve as a preheat mechanism by vaporising the mercury and ionising the argon gas within to lower the tube's resistance. With the gas in the starter's bulb no longer ignited, the bimetallic strip is of course no longer being heated, and as it cools it bends back to its original shape, breaking electrical contact as it does so. This opens the low impedance path, causing the current to stop, which switches off the heaters. There's now also no current passing through the ballast, so the magnetic field being produced by the coil collapses, and just as voltage across a wire coil creates a magnetic field, the reverse is also true, and the collapse of a magnetic field induces a voltage onto a wire coil, and quite a high voltage too, maybe a thousand volts or more in this case, at least for a brief moment. That sudden and much amplified electromotive force is a lot more than the 230 volts we started with, and is now enough to strike the preheated, reduced resistance gas in the tube. Once the tube strikes, its internal resistance drops further, and the heaters now act as electrodes, each end swapping functions as anode and cathode as the AC cycle changes direction, with a current path made up of electrons passing through a gas plasma between them. This gives off a UV light that excites the white phosphor coating, turning into the visible light that we want. With the tube providing a low impedance current path, the heaters and starter no longer receive enough current to operate in those functions, but that's okay, they were only needed to kick off the process, itself sustaining once started. Of course, this assumes the tube strikes first time, the process may have to repeat over several attempts before the tube eventually lights and becomes stable, which is why older fluorescent lights sometimes attempt to strike multiple times, giving the familiar flicker we traditionally associate with this particular technology. With the tube now aglow, the ballast acts in a second function as a current limiter, which is where its choke nomenclature derives from. Without it, the dropping negative resistance of the fluorescent tube would otherwise cause it to suck up an exponential current from the supply until it exploded. Instead, the AC passing through the ballast continually creates and destroys the magnetic field each time it peaks and passes through zero volts, and this induces an EMF onto the wiring that counters the direction of the supply and impedes the input current. This is known as a back EMF, as it's pushing back against the supply EMF, and in our shitty plumbing analogy from earlier, this is what relates to a slight upward rise in our crappy plumbing, which works against the natural flow of current. Like our earlier incandescent lamp that was resistive, many individual component parts of the fluorescent setup also have resistance. The wires, the coil, the electrodes, and passage through the gas inside the tube. But unlike our incandescent lamp, we now have inductive reactants from the ballast's magnetic field constantly being created and destroyed with every AC cycle, and inducing a voltage onto the wiring in the opposite direction to the supply, making our input current work harder. Confused? Yeah. Well, you try writing 10,000 words of bollocks after several Amstels and half a bottle of Jack. Better folk than I have sounder descriptions of how a fluorescent light works, and I don't want to stray too far from topic on this, as it's not really the point of the video. Suffice to say, when we log usage of this lighting equipment, we should see now more than just resistance. Opening this captured data, on the RMS trace we can see a current average of 730.5 milliamps over this five minute recording window. The fluorescent tube is rated at 58 watts, so using 242.7 volts as the window average, <coughs> that's about 0 0.24 amps or 240 milliamps, the rest of the measured current then is presumably being sucked up by the ballast, about 490 milliamps by the looks of it. That's a surprising amount. Uh, looking at the power multi-trace, the P-line true power is sitting at an average of 103 watts in red here, but Q, our reactive power in orange, isn't zero this time and sits at 144 VAR. It's also showing as positive, which if we go back to our phaser diagram, puts it in quadrant one, which is what we expect, as we know inductive reactance is in play on power we're actively consuming. If I bring in this D trace at the bottom, this is the displacement power and represents the phase shift between the current and voltage components. There won't be much here, so let's not get distracted by it. We can see it's only adding about 0.01 kVar to our reactance losses. The end trace here is an overall measurement of the non-active power, that is the reactive power Q plus the displacement power D. Here the N value is going to almost mirror Q as we can see, but ultimately it's that N value that tots up our reactive losses on this equipment. So although reactive power is Q in any calculation, we'll base the arithmetic in this video on what N is showing. 
The green line for apparent power is right up at 177 volt amps. Notice it is not equal to the sum of both the resistive and reactive values, and that's because voltage and current are out of phase with one another, and therefore they don't peak at the same time, unlike how they did before on our resistive loads. We can't just add these two sons of bitches together. We need some mathematical nonsense to prove the numbers. The logger has worked out some average values with true power at 103 watts, reactive power at 145 VAR, and apparent power at 177 volt amps. But just how did it do that? The way the PEL works is to measure the line voltage and frequency, which it easily does through direct contact with the supply, and to measure the total current through the size of the magnetic field as detected by the Rogowski loop. By correlating the timing between the voltage and current, it can determine the phase shift. Let's show that with a little arithmetic. I've recorded an average voltage of 242.7 volts and an average current of 730.5 milliamps. That current is what's being drawn both for the true power and reactive power of this load. Therefore, this is the current component of our apparent power. Indeed, multiplying this voltage and current gives an apparent power of 177 volt amps, so we know the hypotenuse of our triangle. The PEL has determined the phase shift between voltage and current to have a ratio of 0.582, which represents the power factor cosine theta. That's all the data it has, the rest it has to work out. We can determine P, the true power in watts, by multiplying the apparent power by the power factor. So 177 multiplied by 0.582 equals 103 watts. This is our red adjacent line on the triangle. The opposite line in orange and representing reactive power can be found by calculating the square root of hypotenuse squared minus adjacent squared, which is square root of 177 squared minus 103 squared, which comes to 144 VAR. The PEL doesn't seem to say what our phase angle is, but we know our power factor, cosine theta, is 0.582, so the angle theta will be inverse cosine power factor, or inverse cosine of 0.582, which is 54.4 degrees. Looks a fucking lordy. Using this handy website, linked in the description, we can pop in that phase angle for a visual representation of how our current and voltage are out of phase. I'm entering it as a minus figure just so this website shows it as lagging because inductive reactance has current lagging voltage. That spacing between the blue voltage line and orange current line is our 54.4 degree phase shift and the green line shows the effect on our instantaneous power. Yes, I'm well aware this video is a tough wank. Returning to our recording, and the energy plot again shows consistent consumption over time, with the red trace representing our true power, orange showing the reactive overhead, and green for the apparent power. Over this short test period, we've clocked up 12 volt amp hours. Looking at the power factor, as we saw a moment ago, we're tanking at a window average of just 0.579 here, way below that unity factor of 1 to 1 that we saw with our incandescent lamp or resistive radiator. But surely all fluorescent lights can't be this bad. Well, even this one isn't this bad, and it only has a piss poor power factor presently because I've nobbled it. To reduce the inductive losses of the ballast, the manufacturer has cleverly included a capacitor, which I've drunkenly cut out of circuit for the prior testing. This capacitor sits parallel to the supply and works in the opposite way to the inductive reactants we've been seeing. Where an inductor will cause current to lag a voltage by 90 degrees because of energy being stored in a magnetic field, a capacitor will cause it to lead a voltage by up to 90 degrees by storing energy in an electric field. The inductive reactance of our ballast is pulling us away from unity and into quadrant one, but the capacitive reactance of our capacitor will try to pull us in the opposite direction into quadrant four. If the two are well matched, we can hopefully reduce the phase angle and lower our losses. Okay, smart guy, so let's look at the data for another five minute test with the capacitor now back in circuit to see what effect it has. Looking again at the RMS data, and there are a couple of curious spikes. I'm not sure what they're about. The UK voltage is supposed to be between 216 to 253 volts, but it seems my average supply was 255.8 volts on this test and saw a couple of surges while the recording was underway. 1.372 kilovolts was a high here. That's embiggened my voltage scale compared to the previous readings, causing the blue line to appear flatlined for the most part. To be fair, June thunderstorms were afoot whilst capturing this, and it may be that some noise is on the line. 
Anywho, you'll recall the current to drive the fluorescent light was 730 milliamps previously, but it's down to an average of about 534 milliamps with the capacitor present. Looking at the PQS data, true power remains the same as expected, but reactive power is reduced now from 144 VAR we saw previously to 77 VAR. The displacement power is up a little, but the value of N, our total non-active power, is now just 79 VAR, down from a figure of 145 recorded previously. The apparent power is 130 volt amps, down from 177. The energy plot looks as before, but the apparent power over this time has lowered from 12 volt amp hours to just 4 volt amp hours for an equivalent period of time. Power factor has improved from 0.579 previously to an average now of 0.794, with the capacitor working in opposition to the losses of the inductor. It's still nowhere near unity, that clitoral one-to-one -one sweet spot, but it is a lot easier to take up the arse. When this hardware was new, I suspect it would have been better balanced. This capacitor is rated at 6 microfarads plus or minus 10%, so let's see what we can get out of it today. See if it's anywhere near that. And <laughs> Okay, 3.72 microfarads, so yeah, that's way out of tolerance. I do happen to have another capacitor here, taken from another scrap fluorescent, and that seems to still be quite healthy, so for shits and giggles, let's swap them over and we should see an improvement in efficiency for this fluorescent light. Well, suck on this, boys and girls. Power factor is up from 0.794 to 0.861, and current consumption is down from 534 milliamps to 247.8 milliamps, and all with no degradation of light output. So stick that up your arse and set fire to it. If we apply a bit of maths and multiply our new current by the average recorded voltage for this period, we get 60.6 watts, which is more in line with that 58 watt rating stamped upon the fluorescent tube. Let's see what this means for our phase shift. A power factor of 0.861 would mean a new phase angle of 30.6 degrees, which is down from the 54.4 degrees we saw with no capacitor fitted. If I again plumb that number into this site, still lagging as the capacitor hasn't completely negated the effect of the inductive reactants, we can see the traces are now slightly more in sync. So we're heading in the right direction. Current consumption has been reduced by over 46%, with no degradation of operating quality, as the luminaire functions just as well either way. It just doesn't have to work quite so hard with the capacitor in circuit. It's like we've lowered the angle of our upward water pipe. Anyway, you can see how power factor becomes a problem on large commercial sites where there may be hundreds of these fluorescents with failing caps. But hang on David, you handsome prat, I hear you exclaim. If the incandescent lamp has a perfect power factor with no reactive losses, and this fluorescent light exhibited at best, a power factor 14% lower because of its reactive impedance, then why on earth are fluorescent lights considered to be a more efficient lighting option than incandescent and are used in commercial buildings all around the globe? Well, when we're talking about reactants and paying for power that's non-active, it's important not to confuse the efficiency of appliance operation with its method of operation. An incandescent light bulb has a fantastic power factor because it's a linear load with next to no impedance losses. However, an incandescent light bulb is also hopelessly inefficient in its means of operation, as up to 95% of the active power is lost as waste heat. Only the piddling remaining 5% or so becomes the light we want, and that we're forking over the cash for. Yes, my 1500mm fluoro luminaire has reactive losses, but when it comes to getting bang for your buck, even with those losses, and even with the capacitor out of circuit to magnify those losses, it still gives out more lumens for the energy consumed, making it better value for money on operating costs alone. Factor in the longer life, lower heat and reduced maintenance, and you can see why fluorescent has been the commercial go-to until the recent LED takeover. It's the same with other appliance waste byproducts. For example, the heating elements of my toaster emit a visible glow as some of the true power is turned into light. I don't want my expensive energy being wasted as light on this thing, it doesn't toast my tea cakes any quicker. But that waste is nothing to do with reactive losses, it's merely a consequence of some of the true power being pissed up the wall as part of how this appliance operates, and if you look around you'll find many more examples of such.
Indeed, reactants, although defined as non-active power, isn't necessarily a wholly useless byproduct in of itself. In the fluorescent light, we need the properties reactants offers both for the tube to be able to strike and to limit the current it would otherwise slurp up. It's referred to as non-active because, useful though it is for the safe and reliable operation of this equipment, it's nonetheless energy that's being lost as it's not being directly converted into useful and visible light, which ultimately is what we really want. But that's not always the case, and non-active power can very well be a way to needlessly piss money up the wall on energy billing through appliances that are simply inefficient, as indeed my fluorescent light was here because of its failing capacitor. As another example, if shopping around for motors, one model may cost more than another, despite both having the same mechanical characteristics. Yet the model with the better power factor will require less energy to perform the same work, making it a cheaper option over the long term through reduced running costs. Suppliers may penalise commercial installations for having a poor power factor, which traditionally tended to be through there being too many or too heavy inductive loads. In that event, equipment such as capacitor banks may be installed to counter inductive reactants, but these need to be sized to ensure the balance doesn't tip the opposite way with the installation ending up having too much capacitive reactants. Active monitoring and switching of capacitive and inductive loads can be utilised to ensure an opposing reactance is dynamically switched in and out only as needed. Time for some real world examples perhaps, and this is where the likes of the Pell 51 comes to the aid of today's electrician. By leaving this equipment in place over a longer period on an installation, we can get a grip on demand, spikes, peak and off peak loading, and power factor, which is all useful for anyone asking for new heavy loads such as EV charge points, or for those wanting to find what's pissing away the pennies on their energy costs. Here's a 24 hour recording of my own home from 10th July, starting just shy of midnight and ending at 23.59. The 10th was a largely overcast day, so the solar PV on my house won't be working at peak. Looking at the RMS data, we can see by the blue trace that there are a few voltage spikes on the incoming line over this period. Hopefully they were ironed out by my surge protection for the final circuits. The uh, red current trace never drops below 2.6 amps, so the various gadgets and gizmos such as the fridge, freezer, standby appliances, wife's industrial vibrator, etc. all contribute to this constant 24-7 background loading. From midnight to 7am we're largely evenly loaded and fairly flatlined, with the exception of these peaks. After 1am the dishwasher switches on and this rising current will be its heating element in action. That's running an eco cycle which takes nearly 4 hours, and about 2 hours later the heating element kicks in again as its cycle progresses. We see one more peak from this appliance as it uses its element for a third and final time near 4am. Although I've recorded the installation as a whole, if I needed to narrow down what's behind any anomalies, I could use the Pell on a group of circuits or on an individual circuit to obtain more granular data. At 7am the alarm clock wakes me up for my morning wank and accompanying cup of tea, and for the next 12 hours the current trace becomes erratic as appliances are utilised while everyone's awake and sober. By 7pm we're largely back to that background trace as there's not a lot of heavy or diverse loading in the evening, just the family using the TV, laptops or whatever. The baseline current is slightly higher here, then dips back down to background level by about half ten when we all retire for the night with a good book. Some of these big current spikes I can't account for, however those during the waking hours are going to be the electric shower in use. This one at 5.20 will be me getting back from work and showering off the day's dust as I have my afternoon wank. We have another peak here at 10 to 9 that evening which will be one of my daughters using the shower. That appliance is rated at 40 amps and when I'm using it here at 5.20 we can see the total installation demand is nearly hitting 60 amps. Probably because at this time of day the electric hob is also likely to be on as the fucking wife cooks my fucking dinner. I have no gas here, it's all electric. Obviously a winter's day will be a different kettle of kippers to a summer's day, so maybe I'll do a follow up video at the end of the year to compare the two, but on the face of it, my puny 60 amp service seems to just about be coping. Looking at the true power plots, again from midnight to 7am it's all fairly even. There are those three peaks as the dishwasher does its thing. These other large peaks are all going to be the electric shower in use, that's about 9 kilowatts plus background loads. Again, there's me wanking off in the shower at 5.20 that evening. And at the peak we're hitting over 14 kilowatts here, 9 of which will be the shower itself, the rest are background loads plus probably the cooking appliances at that time of day, this being breakfast o'clock. 
Notice the power trace goes negative near 7.45 in the morning, getting back above the zero line after five o'clock. That'll be the solar PV exporting, so these negative peaks aren't my loading. They're what the grid is sucking off as my neighbours wrap their gobs around my electrical junk. Uh, metaphorically speaking, of course. It's a grey day, as always, on this fucking island, so that's energy I'm generating and not utilising. I could look at this lost solar energy and say, well, let's run the dishwasher near 11 o'clock in the morning, so its heating element peaks at that time, and again two hours later near 1pm. And why not? Even on a grey day, a good chunk of the juice that appliance needs would be free. On a sunny day, it might even be completely covered. So there you go, this is showing me already how I can change my filthy ways to reduce running costs. In fact, if we view this as a histogram, you can quite clearly see how underutilised my PV really is. It's actually a bit of a shocker to see it laid out like this. One could make a case for battery storage to capture all that's being lost, but personally I don't like the idea of a lithium incendiary device anywhere near my abode, and I don't plan to install such at this time. It's too expensive and there's just too much to go wrong. I just don't trust a lot of these domestic renewable solutions because just as you get near the installation payback period, something critical and fucking expensive always fails. I've seen it too often. But hey, if battery storage is your business, this is a great tool for convincing clients they can put their PV to better use. Look at the waste here, this wasn't even a sunny day. Otherwise, making simple changes such as moving the dishwasher into the daytime so that its peaks are time to coincide with this dead space could be an easy win. This reactive power plot may look like the heart rate of a paedophile in a playground, but the scale here is tiny. We're zoomed in on some very small numbers. It's very cyclic throughout the period, which may be something like my fridge freezer perhaps, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, these higher peaks will be down to that big resistive load of the electric shower. Notice the VAR scale is negative throughout the whole day, so my installation is apparently capacitive. Traditionally installations tend to be more inductive I think, but with all the electronics in play these days, it's perhaps not surprising to see a wholly capacitive trace. Let's see if we can catch that in live action. It's a sunny morning and the solar PV is active, but my installation is in quadrant four because my background loading is capacitive overall, as we've seen, and my water heater is, at this time, importing more power than the PV can provide. If I switch the water heater off, we leap immediately into quadrant three, and a moment later the export indicator appears on the smart meter's monitor to show I am now generating more than I'm using, with the excess being exported, and that excess, wherever it's going, has an inductive reactance to it. The apparent power sees the baseline slightly dip overnight and get very spiky over the waking hours as appliances are switched in and out. Again, there are the three dishwasher peaks. Uh, while some of these other spikes are the electric shower, there are others I cannot account for. There may be switching loads of some kind. I, I, I don't know without breaking it down further. On the energy trace, true power isn't the linear line we saw in our prior lighting tests and it really nosedives in the day when the PV is pulling its weight. Reactive power is perhaps a little more level throughout the day. The apparent power in green is what I'm actually burning through at this end. For a real head fuck, let's look at my power factor. Wow, I haven't seen something that purple jumping up and down since, well, last night when I was perusing X hamster. Okay, so we know power factor is a ratio and you don't get better than one to one. Therefore, if we're looking at a plus one and a minus one on the scale, we're just talking about the direction of our measured power factor. We saw before that the solar PV is exporting energy during the day, so this is simply showing us positive when importing and negative when exporting, with crossover points after half 7am and half 5pm as the daylight passes its peak over the panels. The window max min values are plus one and minus one, meaning we tickled the hairy bollocks at either end of unity. It's all pretty cyclic overnight, there again are our three dishwasher peaks, that resistive heating load pulling us back towards one, uh, same during those times of the day when the electric shower was on. I can tell the software what my tariff costs are to get an idea of how much I'm paying. For my Eco 7 tariff I can set a base rate of 36.8 pence with a 7 hour override between 1 and 8 a.m. which sees a cheaper window of 16.4 pence per kilowatt hour. Applying that to the recorded data shows a figure for that 24 hour recording window of £3.91. So a very rambly and dry video about a powerful bit of kit, if you want to know where your power is going. It can answer questions on how a client can change their ways to better manage their loads, what appliances are perhaps inefficient, what their demand is, 
how well their renewables are working and whether any new heavy load equipment such as EV chargers can be installed. This thing costs around a grand exvat and I'm afraid I'm not in bed with any supplier for a Bundy Sucks Cock 10 discount. Nonetheless, given today's electrical landscape, it's one of those things many of us will be investing in to add to their loadout. Don't worry, I know this has been a very long winded video, so I'm going to keep this brief. Only a few names to read out. Uh, and, and what a place to read them out in as well, my wholly new coffee shout out studio. Pretty swish, eh? Pretty swish. Not as salubrious as it perhaps looks. It is just the back of the transit van. I've uh, cleared out some of the tools and that old mattress and, well, I've managed to furnish it out. And we can now do the coffee shout outs whilst perusing the streets of Royal Leamington Spa. Oh, that's my local city electrical factors just over there. Smashing. Okay, well, without any further ado, let's crack on and get this damn video over with. Uh, I'm, rather than usually, I'm going to start with the last name first on this one, which is Andy Sniggering Schoolboy, who is a virgin. And uh, the reason I'm reading him out first is because he has sent me This is Rogers Profanosaurus, 10,000 rude words and phrases. Not that I'm normally stuck for the odd profane outburst or a phrase or whatever, but uh, pick one at random, pick a phrase, any phrase. What have we got here? Ooh. Hard to see without my glasses on. Here's one. Plumber's mate. A bored housewife who entertains herself during the day by watching repeats of Flog It and sucking off sundry tradesmen who have called to fix the washing machine. <laughs> Haven't come across any of them myself, but good to know they're out there. So uh, thank you very much for that, Andy. I shall have to uh, bone up on that, so to speak, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, extend my vocabulary a little further for future videos. Uh, the next we have a virgin by the name of Apex. Uh, Apex is one of those who likes to occasionally join in on our UT2004 server. We often play on a Monday evening. If you have the tools and the technology and you think you can take the likes of Nigel and I down in a straight up uh, brawl, then do join in if you please. Uh, if you can get hold of the game, that is, they don't make it easy to get hold of anymore. Uh, another virgin, DLH190, who has left no comment. So uh, thank you for contributing, DLH190. The venerable whore that is Mr. Humbug. Uh, I'm sorry that you missed out on the last video, Mr. Humbug. <laughs> Your contribution came just that, uh, that little bit too late, but uh, thank you anyway. Normal service has been resumed. Uh, more so because our next whore is Andy Karoosh, all the way over on the Isle of Man there again. A notable by his absence in the last video. It's not to say that you guys are required to contribute every time. You, know, you don't, don't feel you have to. But thank you very much for your contribution anyway. Virgin, M Biker UK. Perhaps uh, a, a, a motor cyclist who is making a contribution because of Nigel's uh, newfound uh, motorcyclist ways. I hear he's been going down pubs with bikers because he thinks he's some kind of hell's angle that really is a biker chick. Another virgin in the name of Sparky John W. I presume that's not the JW, but thank you very much, Sparky John W., for your contribution and welcome to the club. A whore, Nigel Tutman. Good old Nigel, uh, thanks once again for your many contributions to this dreadful channel of awfulness. You have one super wanks to read out, uh, which is Ellis Garbutt, 1925. Thank you for contributing via the Yao Chaub, Ellis. For special mentions, I would just like to rattle through the names of Kevin, Julian, Linda and Beanbag Face, who have all uh, checked this video for technical inaccuracies and uh, have picked me up in places where, uh, where I cocked up, basically. So uh, hopefully it's not completely inaccurate now, but if it is, it's all their fault. Let's get those names on the screen. So thank you to all of you guys and gals for sticking your two penorth in. I think the Transit Van Mobile Studio has been a rather roaring success, Nigel, and we're not too sure why we didn't think of this before. Nigel? Oh, shit, he's left, hasn't he? I forgot. Well, who's driving the van? Oh, fuck. Since when have there been cliffs in Leamington Spa? Oh, son of a bitch. Oh, oh jeepers. Oh, bloody hell. Oh, oh fucking hell, me hangover. Oh. Oh, 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 fuck's sake. Oh, 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 o
don't worry folks, it's a transit, it's fucking bulletproof. Uh, this will buff right out. <laughs>